to tell you about my journey in the field of face masks since 2005. So just recapping what we do about infection prevention. We use vaccines, obviously. We have drugs that can be used either as pre- or post-exposure prophylaxis. And then there's a range of non-pharmaceutical measures, including surveillance and early detection, contact tracing and screening, cohorting and various environmental controls, hand hygiene, and personal protective equipment. And masks are a part of that uh, suit of personal protective equipment. Central to all the controversy about masks is the transmission of respiratory infections. And um, those diagrams show you basically the different kinds of transmission. There is droplet transmission, aerosol transmission, and airborne transmission. And basically, the large droplets are the, the ones you can see and feel when someone coughs on you, uh, and they tend to fall a very short distance and do not persist in the environment. And then at the other extreme, you've got the really small particles that can project a longer distance and remain airborne in, um, in the air for hours, um, even up to, you know, days. Uh, but there's also um, a lot of contact, direct contact spread in respiratory infections. So from touching, from hand to face contact, um, from touching surfaces. And it's quite a complex um, mode of transmission. It's never as simple to say any one pathogen is transmitted by one mode. So that brings us down to dogma versus clinical complexity. And in this field, a lot of people kind of very dogmatic about, no, this infection is transmitted this way and that's the end of the story. Well, it's not the end of the story. Anyone who's ever worked in a hospital emergency department knows that there's a lot more complexity to it than just saying, uh, you know, repeating some experiment done in a glass box. Um, transmission is rarely unimodal. Um, and experimental data do not account for the clinical complexities and uh, also inter-host variations. Flu, for example, is predominantly droplet spread, so the big droplets, short um, distance. But there's been numerous studies that show over and over again that it's also spread by the airborne route and also by contact and other transmission modes. Tuberculosis is predominantly airborne, but also has been documented through other modes. Um, SARS, both airborne and droplet, and Ebola, predominantly contact with blood and bodily fluids, but animal studies suggest droplet and airborne uh, transmission are also possible. So getting down to the nitty gritty about masks, surgical masks were originally designed to protect surgical wounds from infection when worn by the surgeon. And there's been three randomised controlled clinical trials looking at this original indication which show there is no efficacy against the original intended purpose. They're not designed for respiratory protection. They do not fit or seal around the face. There is significant leakage around the sides, as you can see in those pictures. And that's me in an influenza outbreak. Uh, and there's no regulation of the quality of surgical masks. Respirators, of which N95 are the most commonly known about, but P2 also are respirators, are specifically designed for respiratory protection of someone who is well and uninfected. They have a superior filtration capacity designed to filter more than 95% of small particles, and that defines their N95 status. They're also designed to fit and create a seal around the face. Um, and they have protection factors that are 8 to 12 times greater than normal medical masks uh, or surgical masks. They need to be fit tested, uh, but there's also a wide variation in the quality of available N95s. That's just a picture of qualitative fit testing. So what do the guidelines say? Well, most PPE guidelines uh, presume, use the presumed mode of transmission for the recommendations as the sole criteria for making recommendations. Guidelines are inconsistent, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, and most guidelines fail to consider cloth masks entirely, which are used very widely in developing countries because they're cheap, because they can be reused. <coughs> this just compares the WHO and CDC guidelines um, in high and low risk healthcare workers, high and low risk community, um, and just highlights that for pandemic influenza, they are inconsistent. And going back to the glass box experiments versus randomised controlled clinical trials, really to know in this complex clinical environment how things work, you need to do RCTs in that environment. 
And we've done um, a number of them. We've completed three trials, one which is still not published, but two big ones in China, and these are pictures from that trial. It's an extraordinary complex undertaking um, because you're measuring you know, the incidence of respiratory infections in um, a highly mobile, busy um, healthcare worker population, and you also have to take into account complexities around things like influenza transmission, season-to-season -season variability, um, diagnostic methods, and so on. So there's been seven household RCTs published, um, including um, our trial done in Australia, and essentially they show that in the household setting, surgical masks can be protective if they're worn early enough and if you're compliant with them. Two other community RCTs were done in university students, so not people who are sick, but uh, well university students, and again, they show that when combined with hand hygiene, um, they can be protective in the weeks three to six um, of the flu season. There's only been four randomised control trials of face masks in healthcare workers, and um, three of the published papers from two trials uh, were led by me. The other um, trial was from Canada, 446 subjects, and there was one very small trial from Japan, which we won't really talk about because it was too small and it didn't um, consider N95 respirators. So you can see the scale of our trials was much bigger, more than four times bigger than the Canadian study, um, and we looked at a range of different interventions comparing N95s and masks. These are the data from our first trial. The blue is the control arm, the red is the surgical mask arm, and the green is the N95. On the x-axis are the different outcomes we measured, and you can see a clear trend that the N95s prevent more infection whichever way you measure it. So my journey into PPE started in Sydney at the Children's Hospital at Westmead, where we did a trial at the National Centre for Immunisation Research um, of community um, household, household use of face masks, which then led to an interest, you know, I sort of thought we need to do a trial in healthcare workers. I searched around for a suitable collaborator for a number of years and then found someone at the Beijing Centres for Disease Control, Professor Wang Changi, who's been a collaborator since then, and we ran these two trials in China. Um, as I said, they're very complex trials to run, um, very logistically difficult, difficult resource intensive. Um, and then I entered the world of politics in pandemics, which, you know, until this moment I thought research was just about science, but I was in for a rude shock. Basically from 2005 to 2009, there was an acceleration in pandemic preparedness globally based on the threat of H5N1. It was identified pretty rapidly that there was a gap in clinical research on face masks. No one had done an RCT ever. So the Chief Health Officer at the time approached me to design an RCT of masks in 2005, which I did. And at the same time, the NIH and the CDC were funding similar trials in the US and other places. And um, we ran our trial from 2006 to 7 with a budget of about you know, one-fifth of what the NIH was giving out. And um, then in May 2009, the pandemic occurred. That same year in August, I was invited to the US Institute of Medicine to sit on a committee for respiratory protection for healthcare workers against um, the H1N1 pandemic because it was known that I had completed this research. It hadn't been published yet. It was about to be presented at a conference. Uh, in September, the IOM recommended to CDC and OSHA that respirators for healthcare workers in initial contact with individuals presenting with an influenza-like illness or febrile respiratory illness were recommended, and also for individuals with, working with confirmed or suspected pandemic H1N1. These were entirely consistent with the existing CDC guidelines. September 2009, I presented the results of this first healthcare worker trial in um, ICAC at San Francisco, which showed efficacy against N95s. The paper was initially scheduled for publication with the other Canadian um, RCT, and uh, we, had, we had prepared it to a very tight deadline. In October 2009, we were presenting the data at IDSA in Philadelphia. We basically modified the results to align with what the reviewers had asked us to change in the paper so that it was consistent with the paper. And all of a sudden I was in the middle of a massive media storm. 
This was the headline, and I have to say, I didn't attend the IDSA conference for personal reasons, and one of my junior colleagues went along and presented this. This was the headline, and a surprise twist. Authors here retracted findings of a study that found N95 respirators were better than surgical masks at preventing flu. This is what I presented at ICAC, which I've just shown you. This is what I presented at IDSA, the exact same data without the control arm, okay? See that? It was still significant actually, just reduced statistical power. Some of the media reports even said Professor McIntyre wasn't even there. I was so ashamed of this retracted research, I didn't show my face. And all of a sudden with our paper, there were suddenly hostile reviews to the revision of the paper, including take out all mention of N95s being superior to surgical masks, tone down the conclusions supporting N95s, there was leaking of confidential information and tra a trashing campaign by email. Many colleagues in the US forwarded me some of these emails. There was also a media campaign and a petition to President Obama. There's the petition from Shia, IDSA and APIC, the peak infection control bodies in the US, and there's my name. They were basically saying the IOM guidelines were based on my research, which they absolutely were not, you know. Um, I mean, I can't talk about that, that committee but because of confidentiality, but uh, it's just not true that they were based on my paper. Some of the milder hate mail that I received at this time, you're in the pay of 3M. Your science is like the MMR autism theory, which for someone like me who spent her entire career in vaccines was quite shocking. Uh, what would Australians know about RCTs? This was forwarded to me, it wasn't sent directly to me. You had a conflict of interest being on the IOM committee. Well, actually, I was possibly the only person who did not have a conflict of interest, being the only foreigner on that committee and having no vested interest in US PPE policy. And all of a sudden I was like Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. I received this same email. Do you know what you've done? Hospitals in the US are now subject to fines for not using N95 respirators during contact with patients infected with novel H1N1. Uh, actually, I didn't do anything other than a piece of research. Sorry you didn't like the findings. And by the way, the guidelines are consistent with the existing ones and were not based on my research. And then of course the other study, the Canadian study, got published, uh, whereas mine didn't get published at that stage. And this was the media recording. The long controversy over the relative merits of surgical versus N95 masks was finally resolved in the study by Loeb and colleagues, which showed that surgical masks were as effective as N95 masks, and the CDC changed their guidelines accordingly. Well, that's just terrific, isn't it? So let's just have a look at this um, holy grail of studies. They, they used a target of intervention, which was that the healthcare worker wore the mask only when they were doing high-risk procedures or barrier nursing of a patient with influenza-like illness. They found that the influenza definition they used was met in about 23% of healthcare workers in both arms. They didn't have a control arm. Their, their um, conclusion was that surgical masks had an estimated efficacy of within 1% of N95 respirators and they assumed efficacies of both types of PPE. Now the elephant in this room, or going back to RCTs 101, is you can't actually prove efficacy of an unproven intervention without a control arm if there's no difference between the interventions. Without a control, control group to determine the rates of influenza in unprotected healthcare workers, both arms may have been equally ineffective or equally efficacious. So which was it? Up to 23% of unprotected healthcare workers, which is a rate identical to that observed in the Loeb trial, contract influenza during outbreaks. That's been shown. Studies of nosocomial influenza generally find lower attack rates in healthcare workers than seen in the Loeb trial. So to me, this suggests equal inefficacy of a targeted strategy. So the current evidence then, four RCTs in healthcare workers available to inform policies, two of these are our studies, um, both which are four times larger and which show N95s to be superior to medical masks. There is no evidence to date of efficacy of medical masks, but it's also a comparison of apples and oranges. So the Loeb trial looked at targeted use of the mask only when the healthcare worker identified that they were at risk. Uh, whereas in our trials, we had continuous use of the interventions across the whole shift. So, this year then, the WHO updated their guidelines on PPE for healthcare workers in May 
Are these evidence-based guidelines? The three publications by my group were completely ignored. They weren't even cited or criticised in these guidelines. We sent a letter to WHO, my lead collaborator at the Beijing Centres for Disease and I, in August, on August the 11th, uh, which was initially ignored. We sent a reminder and on the August the 19th we uh, re received a, a response. This was our letter and um, I've highlighted there some of the things we've said, which is that you have excluded two out of the four RCTs that have been done, the largest ones and the only ones that show efficacy of an M95, which is introducing bias into your guidelines. And at the end we said, you know, uh, please let us know if this is a careless error of omission or deliberate systematic bias in the formulation of your guidelines. This was their response on August the 19th. Thank you very much, but we're very busy with Ebola, we'll get back to you. I sent this response to them. The Ebola crisis is not an excuse to postpone a response, but makes it even more urgent given WHO has recommended medical masks for healthcare workers caring for Ebola patients. Despite the majority of selected viruses in our studies being ones which were not spread predominantly by the airborne route, such as influenza and RSV, RSV is actually spread mainly by contact, much like Ebola, we still found that N95s are efficacious and surgical masks are not. And that tells you that mode of transmission is much more complex than these dogmas. So I'm going to move on and finish up with Ebola in West Africa as a case study. This is a picture of Sheikh Umar Khan, who was one of the leading viral hemorrhagic fever expert in Sierra Leone, and he died of Ebola in July while wearing personal protective equipment and after treating hundreds of patients with Ebola. Um, Ebola is a filovirus which has up to 50 to 90 percent case fatality rate. The natural reservoir is fruit bats, but it also infects primates, chimpanzees and so on. Um, and it's thought that human outbreaks start when a human being has contact in a forested area with an animal and then contracts the infection, then spreads it. And it's always been in remote rural villages in that context near forested areas. The largest past outbreak was in Uganda in the year 2000, and that was 425 cases and the outbreak went for three months. The West African outbreak began in Guinea in December 2013 with the Zaire strain, which is the worst strain, the most lethal. It then spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone this year, followed by Nigeria and now Senegal. These are some of the poorest nations in the world. Apparently, there's also an unrelated outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or Congo which was formerly Zaire. And there's been almost 3,000 reported cases and about 1,500 reported deaths but there's probably many, many more, more than double unreported cases. Many of these people are in home quarantine, they're not even getting to healthcare systems, they're not being diagnosed. There's been documented 240 healthcare workers infected and um, over 150 healthcare workers who have died. This is an unprecedented outbreak because it's the first time Ebola has been documented in West Africa. It's the first time it's occurred in more than one country simultaneously. It's the first time it's occurred in capital cities. There's been shown a high genetic mutation rate and um, there's a study published in Science last week suggests that the, the outbreak strain has emerged from an ancestor, a common ancestor um, in two, the year 2004, which means how did it emerge? You know, has it been circulating undetected in West Africa for 10 years? So the WHO, CDC and Australia and many other countries recommend surgical masks for healthcare workers treating Ebola patients. They simultaneously recommend respirators for laboratory workers handling Ebola. Ebola is predominantly spread by contact with blood and bodily fluids. There is some uncertainty about other modes, including airborne. Transmission isn't fully understood for many infections, and no infection is strictly unimodal. Spread can usually occur by multiple modes, and the relative contribution of each mode is very difficult to quantify. Well, what do we know about Ebola transmission? Well, it's a rare disease compared to influenza. It's much less well studied. We accept that direct contact is the main mode of spread. But the epidemic pattern of this epidemic suggests that other modes are possible. Many healthcare workers who have been using full PPE have died of Ebola. Several animal studies suggest that transmission can occur by non-contact modes, such as airborne and droplet. And there was an outbreak in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which resulted in 
Five of 19 infections in people who visited an Ebola patient but did not have any direct contact, which again suggests there are other modes of contact of transmission. So let's go back to the clinical setting. You know, we know that there's widespread unrest around the world about how the health, among healthcare workers about these guidelines. You know, I mean, email correspondence with people all over the world who are highly agitated about these guidelines. There is this basic inconsistency between the guidelines for lab workers and healthcare workers. Medicine Sans Frontiers recommends a respirator, and as of September the 1st, no MSF worker has been infected. In contrast, WHO workers have contracted Ebola. Ebola transmission in high-risk settings and high-risk procedures is not well studied. And there's certainly evidence from other infections that aerosol spread can occur with, without aerosol-generating procedures. So, the lab is a highly controlled, sterile environment. The hospital ward is unpredictable, uncontrolled, um, a highly changeable, dynamic environment. It is much more dangerous, much more contaminated than a laboratory. So why on earth would you recommend a respirator for a lab worker and tell the nurse you can just wear a surgical mask? What should we base guidelines on? Yes, we should base them on modes of transmission, obviously. But we should also look at uncertainty around modes of transmission. And we should look at case fatality. So if there's uncertainty for a virus that kills up to 90% of people, that should be considered. It's very different from making the same recommendation for flu, where the death rate is less than 1%. You're really playing Russian roulette with the frontline healthcare workers' lives if you get it wrong. We need consistency. Why should lab workers have one guideline and healthcare workers another? We need to look at, are there any vac proven vaccines or treatments for this disease? And if there isn't, it becomes even more important to make conservative recommendations with PPE. We need to look at the immune status and comorbidity of healthcare workers. In developed countries, for example, the health workforce is aging. Most of our nurses and doctors are older, they have chronic diseases. And this may make them more susceptible. And we need to look at observations in the field. Healthcare workers are dying of Ebola. There's been no clinical trials of PPE in Ebola. The only trials we've got to go on are the four published trials I mentioned. And as I said, our trials show that N95s but not surgical masks have efficacy for where the majority of viruses isolated were not predominantly spread by the airborne route. So it's not really about aerosol versus airborne. It's not about glass boxes. It's about protection in the clinical setting and the proof is in the pudding. If you've got a clinical trial that shows protection, it doesn't matter what the route of transmission was or how many, what percentage was this or that. It's irrelevant. It's just an academic debate. You just go on the clinical efficacy data. So, and I think in making guidelines, we need to use precautionary principles. So a disease with a high case fatality rate, no proven vaccine or treatment, with uncertainty around the transmission mode, then we should err on the side of caution. The occupational health and safety of healthcare workers need to be the foremost concern. If our healthcare workers die and our um, health system falls apart, we've got no hope of controlling the outbreak. Meanwhile, there's been no criticism publicly of the CDC or WHO guidelines, but lots of um, commentaries um, supporting their, their, their statements. This one was, the first one there was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, I'll draw your attention to the, the first bit actually relates to something Graham said about malaria cases. The only point I'll make is that in an outbreak setting, the positive predictive value of a clinical defi case definition rises to a very high level. So if you know there's an Ebola outbreak going, the chance of a febrile patient being having Ebola is much higher than in a non-outbreak setting. Um, this last line, more insidiously, requiring precautions that exceed the CDC's recommendations fans a culture of mistrust and cynicism about our nation's public health agency. Well, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what's more important, the reputation of the CDC or the lives of the healthcare workers? The second commentary came out in Lancet on the weekend. They go as far as saying, in fact, goggles and masks might not even be necessary to speak with a conscious Ebola patient, as long as a distance of one to two metres is maintained. Well, which is it? One or two metres? You know, the reason it says one to two metres is because it's based on very sparse data and, you know, no one knows. Why would we be playing Russian roulette with, with healthcare workers? Now, I looked for some cartoons yesterday on the web to try and illustrate my sense of 
um, deep concern about these guidelines and I couldn't find any so I drew my own. <laughs> Good news, you'll be protected with surgical masks. But the lab workers get a respirator for Ebola. And you can see I've also made a comment here about race and equity. Don't panic so much. There's a lot of statements out there about not panicking. Let's not make people panic. Well, to me, there's just cause to be panicked. You may not even need a mask to talk to an Ebola patient. Just use this tape measure. Keep one to two metres between you and the patient. Not sure which, one or two, you choose. And keep still. But ask the patient to keep still too. I mean, you know, whoever said this has obviously has no concept of what the clinical setting is like. You know, if the patient has a cardiac arrest, you just say, sorry, I've got to stay two metres away from you. So, in summary, you know, to make guidelines, we need to think of a risk analysis framework. It is not just about the mode of transmission. That's just one factor that needs to be considered. You need to think of your occupational health and safety obligations to the, to the healthcare worker. You need to think of the disease severity and case fatality. Uncertainty is very important to consider. If there's uncertainty and 90% of people die, well, you've got to use the precautionary principle. You need to think of um, availability of other treatments or vaccines. For influenza, there's antivirals and, and vaccines. There's nothing for Ebola that's proven. And you need to look at equity and consistency with other recommendations. Cost and logistics um, may influence implementation of policy, but they shouldn't influence best practice guidelines. So yesterday, MSF actually expressed no confidence in WHO. The international president of MSF said, uh, made these statements. Um, I'll just read out the last bit. The WHO announcement on August the 8th that the epidemic constituted a public health emergency of international concern has not led to decisive action and states have been essentially joined a global coalition of inaction. She said the clock is ticking and Ebola is winning. The time for meetings and plannings is over. It's now time to act. Every day of inaction means more deaths and the slow collapse of societies. An MSF call for urgent military intervention and for WHO to pull out. Science is not always convenient. Perception and popular views are not always the truth. And disasters breed epidemics of exploitation. Um, I'll just mention that the science study that looked at the phylogeny and genetic um, uh, epidemiology of, of the current outbreak, six of the 57 authors on that paper um, died and five of them died of Ebola and of course they were all um, African authors. The one in the centre there is Dr Sheik Umar Khan who was a leading viral hemorrhaging fever expert. Words issued by instruments of power should not be blindly followed. They should be reviewed critically and if they don't seem right we need to question them. I just want to remind you about the price you pay, the human price, when you don't speak up and you don't question things with the case of Vioxx. That was a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. There was a large industry RCT published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And for those of you who think if it's published in the New England Journal, it must be true, this is a good example that is not the case. It showed a fourfold increase in acute myocardial infarction in the intervention group compared to naproxen. The authors interpreted this as a protective effect of naproxen. This was accepted by the editors and the reviewers. Another case of the Emperor's New Clothes, when there was absolutely no diarrhea. Also, for that to have been true, um, naproxen would have had to be much more effective than aspirin in preventing acute myocardial infarction, and there was absolutely not a shred of data to show that this was the case. There was a conspiracy of silence around this. Many people died from Vioxx of acute myocardial infarction. And there's now a still ongoing, I believe, a massive class action um, against the manufacturer. It was eventually retracted and withdrawn and, you know, um, everyone kind of accepted the truth that this was a dangerous drug. But there was a conspiracy of silence at the beginning. I'd like to acknowledge um, a range of people who've worked on the mass trials and also on some of the Ebola projects we're doing, but particularly Walton Beckley and Mohamed Jallo, who are healthcare workers from Sierra Leone, who are studying here at UNSW, who've given me a perspective, a really um, useful and valuable perspective on the outbreak in West Africa, which is a refreshing change from the cultural imperialism that we are bombarded with every day about this outbreak. Thank you.